Hey guys, Desler Magic here, and huge spoilers today. We are back in the full swing of things with some crazy cards, crazy story revelations. So I thought, let's take it up even another notch. Let's hit the art spoilers, fake spoilers, other spoilers, spoilers from two sets that aren't even out yet. I actually have live in the studio right now a time traveler. He's going to give us some spoilers from 2023. Obviously, that isn't true. Where the hell would I get money for a studio? Hey everyone, welcome to my living room where I'm recording this. So first up, this poster, which is supposed to be some kind of every Planeswalker ever poster or something, I guess. I don't know where it is. I don't know who's selling it. I don't even know if it's officially authorized. Apparently some people got a copy of this somewhere really recently. And somebody spotted this artwork of Garouk. Now remember, everybody wants Garouk back. He's a pretty famous Planeswalker, but uh, Wizards of the Coast more recent super turbo wokeness, of course, probably won't let him come back because, oh, the controversial art with Liliana on it. Oh, he's a toxic white male character. Well, then doesn't that sound like something they would print? So this was presented as never before seen Garouk artwork, but then the original Reddit poster retracted that statement saying, oh, oops, sorry, this is the artwork from From the Vault Transform. I thought, oh, okay, yeah, somebody thought it was new, but it was just from, like, an obscure side product, okay. Except it's not, because this is the artwork from From the Vault Transform. How is it possible that they would say that? Like, it, it clearly is not. Unless it was on the box or something, and I'm missing something, it sure as hell wasn't on the card. So then I thought, okay, do a reverse image search of the cleaned up version of this. Google found astonishingly similar photos, but they weren't of Garouk. So its image recognition is damn good. So this image appears absolutely nowhere else on the entire internet. I manually searched uh, Google Images for the word Garouk. Then I went to artofmtg.com and searched for Garouk. And I cannot find this exact artwork anywhere. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, new Garouk confirmed unless I'm missing something. Like I said, maybe this was on the From the Vault box or something. I, I don't know. They don't tend to draw artwork and then not use it on a card, because that's extremely expensive to pay the artist to do that. It's not unheard of, it's just extremely unlikely. And then for this image to exist nowhere else on the entire internet, that's interesting. Also, I believe people were saying that on this poster, which I don't have a full res version of, um, some of the new artwork from War of the Spark is on here. So will he show up to War of the Spark? Probably not. I mean, he wasn't on the stained glass window it would be weird if he showed up. And then again, they're having like Obnixilis and other problematic I hate everyone characters show up. So eh, maybe, or maybe he'll be in the core set because that's a flashback set. And then they're not really returning They're You know, it's always been like a best of clip episode kind of thing. Well, at least with the two core sets I've seen. I mean, remember, I haven't been playing that long. So that is very interesting. Will Garut come back? That is interesting. Uh, next up, in case you haven't seen this, uh, it would appear Liliana is fighting side by side with Gideon, who is, by the way, still holding the Black Blade. So more confirmation that Liliana appears to uh, turn on Bolas and side with the Gatewatch and not die. Now, how does she do that? Well, that leads me into this new photo, which is Liliana. Uh, she appears to be commanding the Eternals, though. Is it versus Ravnica or is it versus Bolas? And she is wearing the chain veil. Everybody knew the chain veil was going to do something in the storyline because it did on Dominaria. Or actually, no, it wasn't Dominaria, was it? It was uh, versus a sandworm on Amonkhet. Or maybe both. I don't know. Wait, no, she definitely used it on Dominaria because she was too weak and tired from using it to directly fight Belzenlock. And then they did anyway and beat him with the Black Blade. I don't know. Well, maybe Bolas is enabling her to use it without it damaging her. Maybe he just doesn't care. Or maybe she puts it on to break hold of Bolas's power. Although, I mean, it's a pretty damn binding contract. I think it was written with uh, law magic. So the fact that we have the artwork, but not the title of the card really makes this interesting because the title of the card could be Liliana's, I don't know, mutiny is kind of ship specific. <laughs> Okay, I can't think of the word. Um, okay, revolt, insurrection, revolution, uprising, thanks, thesaurus.com. I mean, even, I guess, like, betrayal would kind of fit. All right, this is a bit of an old one, but I haven't seen a lot of people posting it. Uh, maybe my memory isn't serving correctly, but I don't remember seeing this artwork on a card yet. It's Bolas, uh, surrounded by an army of Eternals, and that looks like maybe Liliana in the middle there. And then uh, I don't know what that is above his head. It kind of looks like the Immortal Sun a little bit, but I don't know. This is allegedly from some like pretty early uh, promotional artwork released by Wizards, actually. Like, 
like weirdly early that I'm just seeing it now. So I don't know. I'd say maybe this is fake, but like who would draw this? I mean, come on. I mean, that's more effort than even I'm willing or capable to go through just to prank people on the internet. And that's saying something. So that's it for art spoilers. Let's jump into the last, uh, I guess, card spoiler, just not from uh, War of the Spark. We've got Arcbound Ravager, another one of the most hated cards in the history of the game. It was a lot more hated in modern because of the deck that it was in about two years ago, maybe three years ago. People have kind of calmed down on that a little bit because Affinity isn't quite as big as it used to be. I still want to band. I hate all those tier one decks from back in the day in modern. Every last one of them I hate, except for Jun. That actually plays like a real magic deck. All the other decks, it's like, I'm going to do the same combo over and over and over and win. And I'm like, I'm going to go do something more productive then. Have fun playing against yourself, asshole. Hashtag make modern fun again. So anyway, this is the Mythic Championship Qualifier promo. Um, What the hell is a Mythic Championship Qualifier? I have no idea. I would have said MTG Arena is that. I guess not. It depends which one. They named the paper and the digital ones the same thing. And then I believe they canceled one of them. And also, it's the pro scene, so I don't care. Uh, the short version is, you're not getting one of these. Thanks, wizards. So anyway, uh, let's jump into the actual War of the Spark spoilers, which a lot of these are pretty crazy. First, we've got Desperate Lunge. That appears to be Gideon. He appears to be uh, holding the Black Blade, and he's going for Bolus's face, who seems to be using... All kinds of crazy magic. I mean, he's just like glowing and stuff. So he must be right in the middle of casting the uh, Elder God spell, I believe, is the actual magic that he's trying to use. How do I know that? You guys wouldn't believe just the sheer volume of what's going on in the storyline, like spoilers just floating around. Like basically, I could tell you word for word what's going to happen. But for now, we've got Gideon trying to stab Nicol Bolas in the face. So, uh, it's a two-cost instant. Target creature gains plus two, plus two, and gains flying until end of turn. You gain two life. It is literally just a directly improved Mighty Leap. So, if you're running Mighty Leap, run this instead. By the way, I've been doing a couple drafts, uh, M19, on uh, Arena. And uh, Mighty Leap is just good. It's a game winner if you want to do two extra damage in the air, basically unblockable. And it's also a combat ambush. So, I mean, this with two life on top of it, this is pretty nuts. The problem is take away the toughness and the flying, and we already have a spell that does exactly this and gains two life at instant speed for one, and it's also white. So that might kill the popularity of this. By the way, interesting implication here. If he's gaining two life and that's the black blade, does that mean he hits him? Well, this could be how Bolas dies. He doesn't, and it isn't, but it could be. So the uh, flavor text is interesting. Ravnica held its breath as the hero of the resistance, their last hope, flew through the sky, his dark sword ready to strike a god. Kind of heavily suggests that the spell does go off and that he goes all Super Saiyan blue because the spell succeeds. Nobody in Ravnica would be calling him a god unless the spell went off. They'd just be like, oh, he's a god wannabe. You know, they ain't falling for that. I'm on cat crap. This is Ravnica. They don't play those games here. By the way, oh my gosh, I need this card in foil. So next up, we got Dreadhorde Twins. I think this is a callback to another card from Amon Ket. Or our, I don't even know. Uh, so it's a 2-2 for 4, and it's a Zombie Jackal Warrior. And when it enters the battlefield, amass 2, which is kind of nice. Uh, zombie tokens you control have Trample. Uh, people have been asking about how a mass and then a number works. Um... The way they worded it, it's up for debate, but then they did clear it up in a mechanic article. Basically, a mass three will not bring out three zombies. That's the way it should work, in my opinion, based on how it's worded and how other mechanics work and how abilities go on the stack. They're never considered separate triggers, so they shouldn't stack up, but I guess they just wrote a mass to not do that. So it's like, okay, it works however they say it works is what it comes down to. So yeah, mass two, you would either drop two counters on one existing army, or you would create an army and then put two counters on it. Also, this is another, uh, basically sliver for zombies. Zombie tokens you control have trample. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, the black one, if you recall, says they gain death touch, and everybody knows one of the best mechanics in the game is death trample. Because if they block with five creatures and you have death trample, you can just... Deal one damage to every single one of them, and all of the damage overflows. Unfortunately, zombies don't really get that big, but an army might. So, ooh, will we see Rakdos zombies just for those two? I'd say no, they're too hard to both get out at one time, but eh, never say never. Next up, enter the God Eternals. Oh, that's right. He actually eternalized the gods that he killed. So, um, this is two out of the three bolus colors... For some reason, double blue 
for some reason. So it's a 5 cost sorcery total, and uh, Enter the God Eternals deals 4 damage to target creature, and you gain life equal to the damage dealt this way. Target player puts the top 4 cards of their library into their graveyard, amass 4. And uh, the fact that the gods were back, I mean, not exactly new. I think my like third spoiler video showed this artwork that was leaked somewhere. It's Bolas with the uh, 4 Egyptian gods standing there. So, you know, four damage, a mass four, that makes sense, because there's, you know, Bantu, Hazaret, Kafnet, Oketra, and Ronus. You know, those four. Wait, 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 something doesn't add up here. Oh, it's Bantu, Hazaret, Kafnet, Oketra, Ronus, Scarab God, Locust God, and Scorpion God. It's those four. Okay, I knew that didn't add up. Wait. Okay, I'm having a bit of a laugh, because a lot of you don't follow the lore. Hazaret didn't die. She escaped the city with uh, the survivors from uh, the Eternal Attack. So she's still alive and she's somewhere on Amon Cat, probably just guarding her people and refusing to do anything or go anywhere near this. So I don't think we're going to see her. So you know what that means? The color red doesn't get any assistance from an overpowered, broken, stupid god card. Well, it's a freaking miracle. So back to the actual card. Um, Being a rare and what it does is like, it's kind of neat, but it's one of those that uh, take it or leave it. There's better stuff for five. Except that this is like, this would be a killer card in the existing Demir decks. It's like a limited Vraska's Contempt kind of, more of like a battle at the bridge, but without the scaling. And then you get a giant creature out of it. So that's pretty cool. I think this would be absolutely nuts at the pre-release. So let's just uh, jump right into the blue plated zombie gods. Uh, first we got God Eternal Bantu. So she is a 5-6 five, for 5, and uh, by the way, she was a traitor. She held her memories, uh, the other four gods did not, and she just played along as a sleeper agent for Bolas, and then he killed her anyway. So she got what she had coming. Anyway, she has a uh, Menace, which I think the original card had as well, and when uh, she enters the battlefield, sacrifice any number of other permanents, then draw that many cards. Kind of neat. I mean, it doesn't say non-token. Pretty good for a zombie deck for sure. Uh, and then when God Eternal Bantu dies or is put into exile from the great or from the battlefield, you may put it into its owner's library third from the top. So, I mean, okay, three turns away. A lot of stuff could happen in three turns. You might accidentally shuffle. Your opponent could force you to shuffle. They could set up a mill. They could draw into and then hold on to a counter spell. And remember, this isn't indestructible. So I would say recurring card draw and in any kind of black deck where you get death triggers. This would be fantastic. But it doesn't strike me as immediately dangerously overpowered, which is pleasantly surprising, especially for a mythic. And especially given the history of the Scarab God, my gosh. But the question is, are we going to see them? They haven't been in the artwork yet. They could just be on Amon Cat, what, guarding things? I mean, everybody left the city, so they left the little domed whatever, I forgot the name of the city. It was like I something. I mean, let's call it what it is. It's Space Egypt. I mean, come on. So anyway, the next uh, passenger <laughs> jumping off the UFO from Space Egypt, God Eternal Ronus. This is a 5-5 five, five for 5. It has Death Touch, and when God Eternal Ronus enters battlefield, oh, here we go. Double the power of each other creature you control until end of turn. Those creatures gain vigilance until end of turn, so that even if somebody fogs you, you're still not going to lose. When God Eternal Ronus Dizer is put into exile from the battlefield, you may put it onto its or into its owner's library, third from the top. Holy crap, that is outrageously broken. Utterly ridiculous. I mean, it is timing sensitive. You can't cast this and then a Galta. But I mean, Galta, Carnage, Tyrant, I mean, even just Vine Mare. So you get a doubled and 100% safe swing. There's like four major trample enablers that people either are playing or could be playing. I mean, Terror of Kalsisma, ever heard of it? This card is messed up for five. If they would have made it cost like seven, I would have thought, okay. I mean, yeah, it's in ramp colors, but okay. Five is ridiculous. And then they gave it Death Touch. So now you got a giant 5-5 five, five Death Touch blocker out there. This is so unfair, so broken. You know what, Wizards, why didn't you just put this spell cannot be countered on it? I mean, if you're going to print overpowered trash like this, why not go all the way with it? Hell, make it indestructible too. That's what it's missing. Somebody go on, on Mark Rosewater's god-awful Tumblr page and ask them why they didn't give this cannot be countered and indestructible because clearly they wanted to make a broken, overpowered, unfair piece of shit. But they just didn't do it in the same fashion as Scarab God, and I think we all know they didn't learn anything from that. Well, moving on from this absolute disgrace, we've got Kefnet, which still sounds like a crappy ISP from the 90s. 
Well, if you tell your mom to get off the phone and then dial into this card, you get a 4-5 for 4, double blue. Kefnet is flying, and you may reveal the first card you draw each turn as you draw it. Whenever you reveal an instant or sorcery card this way, copy that card, and you may cast the copy. That is by far the strangest way to phrase that I've ever heard. That copy costs two less to cast. How do you physically copy a card, and then you, you have the option to cast it, but not from the exile zone, which is usually how they do that? Like, where is it? Where is the card? Do you physically have to draw another card? Like, you literally have to copy the card. I mean, did anybody tell the person who wrote this, you can't copy a card, that you can copy a spell and a permanent, but you can't copy a card? In fact, I just checked the gatherer. There has never been a card printed in the history of the game that uses the phrase, copy that card. Wow, this is not the first one that's worded so unusually and so incorrectly in this set. They clearly just don't give a crap anymore. Also, when it dies, exile, blah, 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 battlefield, third from the top, got it, cool. So this is an ongoing effect. You've got a little bit of time to respond to it. Once again, this isn't indestructible. It's annoying, but it's not an automatic recursion like this stupid freaking Scarab God. I'm mean, at a 4 5 flyer for 4 in blue is no freaking joke, by the way. There are very few creatures like that. And then that ability is nuts. So you could do like an all in Drake stack and run one or two of these. So I absolutely hate this card in the standard meta right now. I mean, normally I'd be like, oh, that's kind of a neat effect. Interesting. You might whiff, you might not. You might get some value out of it. I mean, blue plays counter spells. You could do absolutely nothing with a counter spell with that because it sounds like you have to uh, cast it instantly. Actually, I just read it again. It doesn't specify if you if it's until end of turn, if it's forever. There is literally no such thing as copying a card, so nobody knows what that means or how it works. Okay, if you get to just keep it forever, like you just grab a sticky note, grab a Sharpie, make a copy of the card and put it into your hand, which it also doesn't say you do, and then you can cast it from now until forever... And that is that a property of the card? Is that a property of Kefnet? Does that stop being the case if this gets removed? If it gets removed and then recast or flickered, is it still tied to the card? I, there's going to be so many rulings about this stupid card because of the stupid way they phrase this. And by the way, that two discount is utterly ridiculous. So if somebody draws a counterspell, reveals it, and then gets a second copy of a counterspell that they can use from now until forever or even just now until the end of turn... That is toxic as hell. Then if it's Chemister's Insight or Opt, oh my god. Then if you're playing Ral, oh my god. Then if you're playing Is It Drakes, holy shit. Then if it's a thousand year storm deck, I've already lit your deck on fire. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, you asshole. Yeah, this card is, is just bullshit. The whole spell copying, card copying, duplication shit, every single damn version of it needs to go. Every single one. I mean, with cards that have been spoiled and with cards that people are already playing, you can cast spells like eight times now. I mean, that's just inherently broken. And that's on top of Helm of the Host, Quasi Duplicate, Repudiate or Replicate. Um, I think there's like two others. Too much crap is getting duplicated. The whole point of magic and limit four per deck is that you can only have four of something in a deck, making it harder to get out, you know, two. So that on top of Jumpstart, on top of the Is It Guild, on top of this bullshit... Oh my god, it's it's just, it's stupid. And everyone in the entire player base online is already complaining about this card. They're complaining about existing decks, Arclight Phoenix decks. Storm is a 10 on the Storm scale. They brought that shit back for, uh, for Ral. Because, oh, that's what he does, Thousand Year Storm. Then they added Prowess on top of it. It's like, every time they do something like this, have you guys noticed the pattern? Every single fucking time, the entire community, it's just nothing but backlash, nothing but everybody just dogpiling on wizards, and then every fucking time, the entire community is right, and it becomes a problematic deck that everybody hates and makes everyone want to stop playing Magic. And then all Wizards of the Coast says is, it did well at the Pro Tour, yay, pat ourselves on the back, yay, diversity, look, look at all the different deck archetypes, wow. Uh, newsflash, Wizards, nobody gives a shit about the Pro Tour or your stupid Mythic Championships or any of this bullshit. We care about Arena and f &M and fun and enjoying the game and fair, fun gameplay. And that is not how I would describe Standard right now, nor would anybody else who knows what the fuck they're talking about. And most of these opinions are on Reddit and Twitter, where people like to kiss Wizards of the Coast's ass. So don't take my word for it if the ass kissers who are Wizards' biggest fans and their 
enough into magic, it, they're that into the hobby that they take time out of their day to go do a dedicated subreddit about it or follow the staff members on Twitter and reply to their tweets. If you've pissed off that community and the vast majority of it is telling you that your game is broken, not fun, and just standard is in a shit state, maybe wake the fuck up and listen to them. So anyway, I'm sure it gets worse from here. Let's move on with this shit. So we got uh, Gideon's Battle Cry, another rare. It's a four cost uh, sorcery speed white. Uh, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature you control. You may search your library and or graveyard for a card named Gideon the Oathsworn. Reveal it and put it into your hand. If you search your library this way, shuffle it. By the way, this is from the Planeswalker deck. I probably could have led with this. So it's number 267 out of 264 because apparently this is Pokemon. We've also got Gideon's Company. It's a human soldier, 3-3 three, three, for 4. Whenever you gain life, put two 1-1 one, one counters on Gideon's Company. I have a feeling this will be played outside of the Planeswalker deck because of that. Uh, I, I told everybody, I'm just waiting for another Ajani's Pride Mate. That's all we need. Something where something reasonable happens whenever you gain life. This is going to blast Mono White into orbit. The problem is that deck's really fast and this costs 4, so that's a little bit of a speed bump. But I'm playing it. I'm playing this card. Hell yeah. Uh, then if you pay four, you can put a loyalty counter on target Gideon Planeswalkers. So you can just ignore that and just run it as is, or you could actually do that. So this is a double a Johnny's Pride Mate. Double. Okay, you could slow it down, go Banalish, take out all the one drops, you know, slow it down and go white mid-range, but still keep the um, life gain engine. And oh my God, you could just crush Red Rush. This is probably the most important and significant card that's been spoiled so far. And it's in the Planeswalker deck. So next up, the front man himself, Gideon, the drawn like complete shit. What the hell happened there? He looks like a drunk Scotsman. See, that would be the Black Blade if it was black. So this is a four loyalty Gideon for six mana. Ooh, do you hear the train pulling into Value Town? And his arrangement for, I guess, technically being a mythic is kind of weird, uh, but his passive is whenever you attack with two or more non-Gideon creatures. <laughs> okay, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each of those creatures. That's pretty nuts, but I mean, it's going to be a little late in the game by the time you get him out. And then uh, plus two until end of turn, he becomes a 5-5 five, five white soldier creature that's still a planeswalker, prevent all damage, blah, blah, blah. We know what it does. Plus two, do the Gideon thing. Uh, negative nine, so he only has an ult, he doesn't have a minus. Um, exile Gideon the Oath Sworn, and each creature your opponents control. So in other words, Gideon dies in the storyline. Um, honestly, like, this is a crazy good card, but, like, not for six. If this costs four, it, it would be insane. It would be a $20 card. So I don't know, it's probably appropriate for the Planeswalker deck, but I'm not seeing this clear in even, like, four bucks. And uh, also we got Orzhov Guildgate. Uh, this is in the Planeswalker deck. So don't know if this will be in the main set. I would imagine they'd print all 10 Guildgates, but that hasn't been confirmed. So a bit of an odd spoiler. Next up, uh, the Gatewatch is apparently going all Yuri's Revenge on Bolus's ass. Um, I guess dragons don't usually do stuff under the sea, so that's clever. So this is Silent Submarine, which... I feel like it's going to be something else in English. Uh, double blue, so it's a colored vehicle artifact, which uh, I believe Mark pretty much spoiled that they were going to do that ahead of time. And uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, draw a card. That's a nice little touch. And uh, crew two, just straight up, and it's a two, three. You know, in a blue deck especially, that's not bad. So next up, okay, what is going on here? Spark double. Okay, so he does illusions not literally duplicating actual sparks. I feel like that's pretty advanced magic and probably impossible too. So is that his nickname or is he fighting without his spark and he made a realistic illusion that carries his spark, which also seems impossible. Did he split his spark in half like a Horcrux thing in case he dies in battle? Oh, there's no flavor text, so we ain't gonna get an answer, but let's see if we can figure it out from context. Um, this is a zero zero creature illusion, so it seems like Spark Double is literally referring to the duplicate. Uh, it's cost four, and when it enters, or you may have Spark Double enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature or planeswalker. What? You control, except it enters with, a, with an additional 1 1 counter on it if it's a creature, it enters with, with an additional loyalty counter on it if it's a planeswalker, and it isn't legendary if that permanent is legendary. What an awkward, clunky way to write that. I can't think of a better way to write what they want to get done with that, but, um, you know, okay. So this card is absolutely batshit crazy. We already have Replicate and Repudiate. We've already got, um, 
quasi duplicate. Uh, I said it before. Let's see. Helm of the Host. Oh, we've got some artifact doublers. We've got uh, Sahili, which turns an artifact into a creature. So I'm going to call that cloning. I thought we had a dominary illusionist that can, it's like a shapeshifter. Maybe not. And now we've got this. So yay. And this one can do legendary stuff too. Because I was just thinking, two Carnage Tyrants is not quite enough. We need two Galtas, too. This is obviously going in a Simic deck, and it's obviously going to be something degenerate as shit. Then the plus one, plus one counter on it, I mean, it, this is ridiculous. We don't need this stupid fucking card. And this is coming from somebody who loves cloning shit. You know what the Teferi deck doesn't need? Two Teferis in the battlefield at the same time. I literally have a deck on the arena called Simic Clone Wars. And even I think this goes too far. So yeah, this really pisses me off. There is going to be some seriously broken shit in the next uh, iteration of Standard, I guess you would say. Next up, hey, Tamio is here, and all of a sudden she's Asian. Okay. I mean, she is from Space Japan, a.k.a. Kamigawa, but they are retconning this pretty freaking hard, just suddenly taking a weird-looking, you know, humanoid... You know, basically on par with Vidalkin and just making her Asian. That is honestly pretty offensive. Good job, wizards. I do believe that's referred to as doing a JK Rowling. Oh, no, she was Asian the whole time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, did I not mention that? Oh, do you have pictures literally contradicting that? Oh, did we clearly just change this so that we can look diverse and woke? So anyway, there's a five loyalty four cost planeswalker and uh, spells and abilities your opponent's control can't cause you to discard cards or sacrifice permanence. That is weirdly specific. Then we've got plus one, choose a non-land card name. Then reveal the top four cards in your library. Put all cards with the chosen name from among them into your hand and the rest in the graveyard. Uh, in the average game, you would have a one in ten chance of getting that correct. So good luck with that. Oh, and you just get to draw the card if you're correct. So yeah, you could place it there. She could go rescue one of the gods that's in the top three, but like, that's it. You are never, ever going to hit the card that you guessed naturally. And then her negative three is return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Okay, that's pretty damn good, but she can do that once. This card is absolutely terrible. This is probably the worst Planeswalker I've seen from the set so far. This makes Tybalt look useful. So then we've got Tamio's Epiphany, where clearly she just realized she's Asian. Surprise. Uh, this is a four-cost sorcery. You scry four, then draw two. So pretty typical Tamio card, typical blue card. Um, I mean, for four, is Chemister's Insight better? Yeah, probably just because of Jumpstart. So I don't know who will really play this. Still, if you're trying to enable some glass cannon combo, oh my gosh, yes, but there's so much control in Standard and there's like zero combo decks. I don't know. I don't think people even touch this until bare minimum after rotation. Now, what any of this has to do with Kefnet is interesting for the storyline, but uh, I don't know. Oh, and a quick note, as far as I know, Oketra wasn't spoiled yet. So I guess we'll uh, watch for that. Should be interesting. Two different mono white decks are already dangerously powerful. It's what I personally have been using on Arena for the last two seasons and getting to Mythic with it almost exclusively. So I can't wait to see what Zombie Mittens is up to. That should be really interesting. If it's another whenever you gain life trigger, that's it. That's the end of the game. It'll just be mono white life gain and nothing else. So anyway, thanks for watching and don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss the next couple crazy ass spoilers. It's like watching a train wreck. You just can't look away. No matter how bad it gets. I'll see you guys next video.